using the HTTP API, maybe a short question up front. Who of you has used the HTTP uh, API before? You? Cool. Uh, actually, a bunch of people. Uh, how many of the others who just didn't raise their hand, how many of you have written frameworks the old style way using Glyph Mesos? Okay, no one? All right, I hope we still have uh, some new exciting stuff for you or some best practices of writing uh, HTTP-based frameworks. Uh, maybe just about who we are. So we, that's actually uh, Max from RangoDB. Uh, RangoDB is actually a pretty cool partner of us, uh, of Mesosphere in Germany. They basically, they're always like the guinea pigs implementing new features. As for example, they were one of the first frameworks uh, using the new persistent volumes back when they were released. And now they're actually also uh, one of the first ones like trying to migrate from the old way to the new way. There are actually like a number of frameworks already written with the new HTTP API, but there aren't so many who actually moved over from the old style way to the new style way. All right, uh, just as a brief outline what this talk is about. So we're gonna talk about uh, the HTTP v1 API, and that was actually a Mesos 1.0 milestone. So um, it officially was supported in there. Bits of that were already like prior versions, as for example, the scheduler and executor API in Mesos 0.24. Uh, and as you can already hear from those different names, it's actually, it's not like one big API, but it's actually several APIs. It's actually uh, the framework part, which consists of the scheduler and the executor APIs. And then there's like, as well for operators, so for people who actually want to control a cluster, there's yet another API called the operator API. Overall, it's like an RPC light based HTTP API and the coolest feature in my opinion that it actually it allows for language independent schedulers. Before you always had like this lit mesos dependency and there were people uh, managing drivers for example for Java, for Go, but it was always really hard to keep them up to, uh, up to the, like the current development, up to the most recent developments. So it's really nice to have that like independent of the language, basically in any language supporting HTTP, you can now write your framework out of the box, basically. We're gonna to come to some limitations later during this talk. Uh, so in the beginning, in like the first years of Mesos, there was just lit Mesos, and that was all you had to use for writing your own framework. So how, how did that look? So imagine we want to write like a Java-based framework. If we want to write a Java-based framework, and here we only care about the scheduler part, we don't care about the executor part. Uh, so we actually, we had the Java library, uh, mesos.jar, and that was internally using, uh, why JNI was using like lib mesos, uh, the library. And uh, basically like this constructs of those two uh, libraries could then talk to the Mesos master and basically uh, receive like the job offers and start new tasks and basically do anything a scheduler would do. So overall that actually had several disadvantages. The first one being it wasn't really portable. So whenever you wanted to, this was like specific to Java slash Scala based framework, but like for example if you wanted to write your Go based framework, as we just heard we see for example Kubernetes, uh, you actually you had to write another uh, scheduler and another connection to Lib Mesos. Uh, so that was really uh, nasty to keep track of that. Second part was it was really hard to debug. So whenever you found somewhere an issue that like offers weren't received, offers weren't sent, you actually it took a really long time to figure out at which step throughout this chain it was actually failing. And there was no easy way to get like blocks throughout the entire uh, life cycle. Um, there was also an upgrade dependency. So basically, uh, the frameworks had to be upgraded if we had some breaking changes within like Lit Mesos. And so you couldn't just keep your frameworks running. It didn't happen often, but it was still like annoying that you had to keep track of basically this development of Lit Mesos. And 
maybe from an operator perspective also pretty annoying is uh, that sometimes the response codes change. So for example, imagine like the state versus state summary endpoint where we added new fields and you never couldn't be really sure uh, what you got because there could have been new fields added, sometimes we deprecated fields. So there wasn't like a real versioning uh, of the different API. So that's kind of uh, what seemed part of the motivation for uh, moving to the HTTP based API. The other, the second big part is like the networking part of this. So with the lit Mesos, it was really from a networking perspective, uh, there were some challenges. So what happens if I have a firewall in between uh, the master and my scheduler? What happens if one of them is running in a container? I really had to keep track of how the networking was working in those cases. All right, let's break down this wall in between and uh, actually see how we can get going uh, further with that. Before we break down walls, we should actually understand how many APIs there are. As said initially, it's not just one API being used by Mesos, but it's actually it's a bunch of them. So first of all, the one we mentioned before is the scheduler API. The scheduler API is actually for the scheduler talking to the master node and basically receiving offers, starting tasks, receiving uh, task status updates, uh, and then reacting to that. So that's what the scheduler API is used for. On the other hand, down on the agent, we have the executor API, which allows the executor to talk to the, a uh, to the uh, which allows the agent to talk to the executor and vice versa. And this is basically then for the task running on those nodes that they can communicate with Mesos, with the Mesos agent uh, running there. And that's called the executor API. And together, as those are required to write a framework, uh, both the scheduler and the executor API are uh, called framework API. Um, then there's actually one other person involved, and that's the operator. So also the operator, he needs to interact with both the master and also with the agent to uh, start tasks, to set photo, to set limits, uh, change logging levels, and basically anything an operator would do. And uh, that's actually managed by the operator API, which again consists of the master API for communicating with the master, and the agent API for communicating with the agent. Internally, uh, that's actually not yet touched uh, by this effort to have a consistent, more or less consistent HTTP API, is the internal API between master and agent. So that's basically still left as it was before, but that also it's not really visible or it should be visible to any framework developer. So that's why we first felt we want to get the uh, APIs to the outside correct, which you as a framework developer might use, and then as a next step, tackle like the internal uh, backlog. All right, now we understood basically what's happening and we can actually start building something new uh, around this. So the goals. Uh, the main goals were, first of all, like this one slide we saw about the networking issues, to really enable it to work inside firewalls and containers more easily without requiring like manual adjustment and having to be aware of that. Uh, second, uh, to allow for pure language uh, clients that you don't have this dependency anymore and basically can pick any language supporting HTTP to write your scheduler, to write your service uh, slash framework. Uh, also the versioning I mentioned, just to make it easier for us um, to keep track of the different versions of our API and also make it more better visible to the operators which API they're currently using. Um, maybe like what I really, really like as a goal is like the documentation part. So the old APIs, they were just like kind of developed, basically also happened like back in the Twitter times and now we actually have like as a concrete goal to have some like better documented so they can actually uh, be easier used and easier understood by having better documentation from the start and also keep that going when we add new versions. So those were the goals. And this is basically what, what came out as uh, the current implementation of the HTTP API. 
So every call you make, uh, may it be from an operator, may it be from a scheduler, is actually it's a post request. And um, then there are different responses depending on what you did. You can subscribe to certain events. So for example, if you're an operator, you might want to subscribe to the event stream and just see what's going on in the cluster. And then you actually receive a 200 OK. And following that, you receive a record I.O. formatted uh, a stream of data. Uh, record IOs that basically means like for each event which is going to be streamed to you for like each package, you're first going to have the length followed by the JSON of the package. It's actually a really simple format. And um, then there are also like non-subscribe calls. So if you just set to start a new task for example, and that would actually result in the 202 accepted response. <laughs> All right, how, do, how does it actually look in the cluster? So we have a scheduler, and the scheduler would actually first subscribe to the master because it wants to be connected, and this is also a connection which should be persistent uh, throughout the lifetime of the scheduler. So uh, we basically, we subscribe with our framework info, uh, similar as we would have done initially when we register with the master, our new framework, and then we actually we get a response, and this response it's a stream. So uh, the first one is going to be subscribed. So it's going to tell us, hey, yeah, we successfully registered with the master, and uh, that's then actually followed by offer event. So then, similar as we did before, when we got offers, we now get offers via the stream of data. And uh, it's actually, it's pretty much the same format as we had before. So if we've seen that, we can easily follow and understand that. All right, and as a scheduler, I can then decide to accept that offer, for example, and uh, then basically start a task on that as, as I would have done uh, in the old API. So with that, that's actually the success call. It's not a streaming one. So I simply get like a response back and then I know, hey, my tasks are good to go and actually the master is aware of them and will try to start them on the agent. So next, the master actually needs to launch them on the agent. And uh, therefore, the agent will actually subscribe, to, will spawn the executor and then subscribe to the executor because they also need to communicate and this is now this is the second part of the API, which is the uh, executor API. So uh, once uh, it has a subscribe, they can actually also like, the executor is gonna give responses, whether tasks have successfully started, whether anything has failed, back to the agent. Um, maybe just when we have this picture, what's interesting, uh, over those subscribe connections, so basically, between the executor and the agent, and between the scheduler and the master, there are also like heartbeats flowing. So basically, uh, they're always checking whether the other part they're communicating with is still alive, so they can actually detect uh, when something is failing. So this is also like kind of important. If you write your executor, you should really implement and take care of those heartbeats, so that you can always make sure the other side is still running. All right, uh, this is exactly uh, this slide, what it's about. So periodic heartbeats, events, they are sent by the master. So going back to the slide, so the master is going to send to the scheduler from time to time uh, those heartbeats. And it's actually up to the scheduler to receive them and to basically check uh, that the master is still alive. So if after a certain timeout it's not alive, it uh, needs to be aware and basically reconnect, similar as before. Um, and so, same, the master does the same. So the master is actually tracking those persistent connections. And if they fail, uh, then it's actually going to allow the framework to reconnect within the failover timeout. All right, this brings us to the operator API. The operator API is uh, used by you know, like a human operator, 
in theory, actually, a framework could use it as well. There's nothing actively preventing a framework from accessing the uh, operator API, but we highly recommend not to do this because uh, it's not really the intention. So if you have a valid use case, you might want to go for it, but uh, it's not the intended use case. Okay, and uh, also here, uh, I can simply, it all is based on a post request, so I can simply subscribe, for example, to the event stream of, in this case, the executor, and so this is on like the um, uh, agent side, and they actually now have a nice abstraction. So basically, before, when I wanted to, uh, as an operator, I wanted to keep track of the state of my cluster, what I had to do was actually, I had to pull state summary like every five seconds, for example, every 10 seconds. So I actually had to do polling to keep track of the state of my cluster. And now, actually with this event stream, we have something really nice, so we can just, Marathon actually had that already for a while, and what it allows to do is basically just keeping track of what events are going on in the cluster. So for example, uh, if I subscribe to that as an operator, I might actually uh, get, for example, a task updated event. So I'm basically I'm proactively being informed if uh, something is going on in the cluster. Um, again, this is like the record I/O format. So I first, actually, I have a label. I first get the event length, uh, telling me how much is expected afterwards, and then I get like the task, uh, the actual JSON of uh, what has happened in the cluster. Cool. Uh, versioning. So versioning, as mentioned before, uh, it's kind of our goal is to have them matching the major versions of Mesos. So for example, we are right now at uh, Mesos uh, version one. So uh, this would be like, this is the current API version you can use. And if we have Mesos 2.0, it probably will look then like uh, version two of the API. In between, we guarantee backwards compatibility. So uh, we have similar uh, a similar definition of this uh, compatibility as, for example, Protobuf does. We allow ourselves, for example, to add new fields. Uh, so if we want to add also new events, this is okay, but uh, we wouldn't remove something or rename something. So basically your old code, which is looking at those different events, it should still work as, uh, yeah, we're mostly like adding stuff on top. And I think this also makes it easier for people, both implementing frameworks, first they can rely that it's going to keep the same and they don't have to change uh, or recompile once there's like a new libmesos version. And uh, secondly, it also makes it easier for operators to write scripts uh, polling like the operational state of, of their cluster. The API status, uh, as of uh, Mesos 1.1, uh, or actually even longer. This is the same is true for uh, the uh, 1.0 release. The scheduler and executor API, they, they are stable. So we would actually recommend framework writers to really use it from now on, because what's also gonna happen in the future is that uh, features are just gonna be implemented for the, uh, API, for the HTTP API. So for example, this event stream, you can't use it if you're using like the old libmesos implementation. Uh, so that's why actually this is like the most important part that you can actually switch over your frameworks and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. And the uh, operation API, we consider that still unstable. That means we might actually still rename some fields there we might want to remove some fields, but the overall concept is going to stay the same. We're just not sure about certain implementation decisions there yet. And from a status perspective, there are actually already like some client libraries, and we'll see that later. We'll highly recommend you to use them as well. So if you just go to like the Mesos uh, documentation, 
you'll see that there are like a number of client implementations like in C++ and directly in the Mesos code. There's like one JavaScript framework uh, also being based on the HTTP API. There's like the uh, DCOS SDK, which is also for which you can internally use the HTTP API. Uh, so whenever you want to start with a new framework, it's really good to look at that. Because it's still, it's like kind of hard what you have to do, uh, or there are some pitfalls, uh, as we'll see later. All right, this actually brings me to ArangoDB. As mentioned earlier, ArangoDB, they're all the, uh, often like one of the first implementers or first users of new Mesos features. And uh, so I would hand over to Max, who can tell you a little bit about uh, what they have done in respect to the HTTP API. Yes, welcome. So before I started talking about uh, framework and HTTP and uh, all the rest of it, let me just give you a brief overview of what ArangoDB is and why we would need a framework for it. First of all, ArangoDB is a database and it is a multi-model database. That means we support multiple different data models. In our case, it is a document store, JSON documents, but it is also um, a graph database and the two and also key value store functionality if you just uh, use it as a key value store uh, in one engine yeah, so it's not different database engines next to each other it is one engine which has a query language which supports to mix and match all the three data models and the API is HTTP, REST, so we have for a long time used uh, HTTP and REST and JSON documents. And it allows you, in our query language AQL, to do joins with based on documents. It allows to do graph queries. And it allows to use transactions. And all of this in one engine, and you can, can even mix it within a single query. Furthermore, the database is extensible. We embed Google's V8 engine in the database server, and therefore you can extend the already available HTTP REST API by your own routes. So if you need, for example, a data-centric microservice, which is close to your data and, and executes queries efficiently, then you can implement that in JavaScript and run it on the database server. And you can make a good abstraction of this service by exposing it as an HTTP REST service, which is directly handled with, from within the database. Now, what is not on this slide, but what is evident, is that ArangoDB is a distributed data store, which scales horizontally. And therefore, uh, we very much like to integrate with DCOS and with Apache Mesos to be able to deploy ArangoDB easily. And thanks to the universe in DCOS, it is literally two clicks to deploy a distributed ArangoDB cluster in a DCOS cluster. And if you later need more servers, you can just scale up via the user interface. If you need less servers, because maybe the amount of data has shrunk, you can actually scale down and we handle this gracefully by first cleaning out the data from some servers and then shutting them, them down, down in a controlled fashion. And here you see, distributing a, a, or deploying and scaling a distributed data store with state, of course, is a difficult task. And DCOS and framework writing is exactly the right approach for us to, um, to give a good user experience for people who want to use a run with the Oh, this was the wrong direction. So, we have written a framework, most of it and uh, that was done by myself and colleagues of mine, but that is hard. So let me just uh, explain why it is hard to write a, scale, a framework. Well, as you know from Mesos, 
a part of the planning and the, the scheduling, that actually the second level of the schedule, happens in the framework scheduler. After all, it's called a scheduler. So it is not so that the framework just tells the system, I need this and that task. Rather, it has to take part in this. It has to receive offers about free resources in your cluster and then make a decision as to whether this is accepted and used to deploy a task or not. So there's a certain difficulty uh, in the scheduling logic, in particular because uh, we use persistent volumes. So we want that if a task goes down for whatever reason, that it comes back up on the same node and still sees its old data. Otherwise we would have to resynchronize, which would take a longer time. Now, a second part which makes it difficult to write a framework is it needs to be resilient in its own right. If you want to run a database in production, not only the database itself must be resilient and fault tolerant, but also your scheduler. So if somebody kills the scheduler, and if, for maybe just a silly reason because you need a new version, then the framework must somehow find its own state and recover from the crash and uh, get into action and pick up the pieces which were left. We do this by using Zookeeper and uh, storing the latest state of the Arangodiki cluster as we knew it in Zookeeper. So then when the framework starts anew, you can just have a look in Zookeeper and uh, pick up the things where they, where they were left off. Uh, by asking Mesos, is this still running this task and so on, and uh, doing the task reconciliation. Anyway, the, the framework, it does deployment, or help, help with the organizing, it uh, deals with persistent volumes, it uh, organizes a part of the failover, another part is handled in the ArangoDB parts themselves, and it takes part in up and down scaling. So if you click scale down in the ArangoDB user interface, then you somehow express the wish that the database should shrink. And uh, then, first of all, the database in itself uh, moves data away from one node. And in the end, uh, the framework scheduler notices that this node is now empty and can shut down it in the control way. So a lot of things happen. And if you actually look at the complexity, our framework is written in the C++ language because we started at a time when Mesos was essentially the only option. And it is over 5,000 lines of code, just the framework scheduler. And th this is uh, the slog count, so this is taking out commentaries and, and empty lines and so on. If you, if you really, really count the source code lines, it's over 12,000 lines of code. Now, this is a code base which has to be written, debugged, maintained, and it causes a lot of headache. Yeah? So, now, Let's see how we can maybe improve this situation. Um, not only was writing the framework in itself complicated, we had also issues with respect to the management of this. We were using libmesos, and uh, libmesos is a huge thing. It itself has 190k uh, source, source code lines. And uh, even just a build environment in a Docker container to build our framework needs three gigabytes of disk space, which can be a problem on, on, on the Docker Hub. Now, um, so there's a lot of uh, technical difficulties with respect to linking, with respect to using the right libraries, version dependencies, and um, uh, it doesn't become easier because uh, usually the framework is deployed, deployed as a Docker image. We have the problems you have mentioned that in the old API there has to be a network com uh, uh, communication in both directions. So not only has the framework to open the connection to the master, but also the master connects back to the framework. So there's lots of firewall issues and so on. And um, therefore, uh, <coughs> it was a huge headache. Now, what do we hope um, the HTTP framework can improve on this? So nowadays, and this is now different from a year ago, I would say, uh, we wouldn't recommend to write your own framework in C++ from scratch. Rather, we would recommend to use a software development kit which uses the HTTP API. 
In this way, the, the effort to write a framework is, is much reduced. Let me say a few arguments about this. For example, you can develop your framework in any language. You are not limited to C++ or Java. So you can take JavaScript, you can take Go, or whatever uh, language you want. The communication is JSON, that is clear text, and uh, it's easier to debug. For example, you can just uh, uh, use a network sniffer and just see what uh, communication goes on between the framework and the master, and uh, very much quicker, quicker uh, home in on problems. You have a lot less code. So for example, um, just recently we have started to experiment with the JavaScript framework Jörg has mentioned. Um, so this is, I think, actually a link, the blue one, Jörg, isn't it? Yeah, to the GitHub repository. Um, and so we are, we are trying to see how we could um, move our framework to maybe a JavaScript implementation or maybe something else which uses the software development kit and uses HTTP2, uh, uses HTTP, and uh, which would then allow us to get rid of libmesos, have a much easier way to build the framework, and to remove a lot of boilerplate code. So, the first experiments are encouraging. So, for example, in this JavaScript framework, or framework maker, I can just essentially describe what tasks for ArangoDB have to be started, how their dependency is. And so, I don't have to write thousands of lines of C++ code, rather I have to write a few dozens lines of code, of, of JSON, uh, to describe um, what tasks I want. So it's much more compact, and obviously some complexity still remains, so if we want to achieve all the things we have done with the C++ framework, to handle failover, to handle scale, and, uh, and things like that, uh, then still you have to do some kind of coding. But again, it can be done in another programming language and can be done in a much shorter way. So, let me say two more things to this. First of all, a warning. Uh, this software development kit is early stage. Um, it's probably not yet ready for production, but uh, it's encouraging, that's, that's what I want to say. And secondly, there's another talk tomorrow by Jörg and Ken. Uh, it's actually um, at 10.25 in which lecture hall, also here? Uh, actually not sure. Whatever, you, you'll find it out. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, which is um, devoted to, to the topic of writing stateful frameworks. So there's more uh, to be said. Okay, let me uh, finish by uh, mentioning a few challenges we found when experimenting with the JavaScript framework. There's actually a fundamental uh, thing missing from the HTTP framework, namely the state obstruction. In the libmesos, you could, uh, a framework could persist some state to say Zookeeper or any other place via a state abstraction uh, API, and uh, that is actually still missing in HTTP. So therefore, whatever framework you write with HTTP cannot persist state easily. And therefore, it's very hard to make it so that if the framework comes back after a crash, picks up the pieces where it's to begin with, it, it can't really remember, for example, the framework ID with which it has connected to the master. So if it now connects to the master, it's probably considered to be a new framework. So that is the fundamental problem. And this, uh, this, uh, the four, four power points here are more of a problem with the particular JavaScript uh, software development kit we found. Uh, it doesn't yet support persistent volumes, and uh, it's difficult to organize failover at this stage and scaling afterwards, and also it doesn't do the new operations API. So, so that should be uh, my word of warning that this JavaScript code is maybe not quite production ready, but the point remains for the future that uh, I think it will be considerably easier to write frameworks using not only the HTTP API, but also the software kits uh, uh, supplied. And with this, I uh, hand over to Jörg. If you have any more questions about RangoDB or about our framework, uh, just contact me uh, after the talk or whenever.
Thank you very much for both presenting and also implementing and trying all to do Mesos features all the time. Uh, maybe just like two more words, uh, one for this slide, and this is also like a, like underlining the point you just made that always like using a SDK is actually a pretty good choice because like the last point about operations, this is always something you should keep in mind uh, when also writing your software. It's basically like how can you monitor, how can you debug, how can you update. So if you have a new version of your framework, how can you roll it out in a safe fashion? And that's actually where uh, SDKs come in quite handy because otherwise this is something like everyone has to invent from scratch uh, as well. And just jumping back uh, one slide. So uh, this. Uh, no this uh, JavaScript SDK uh, Max just mentioned. In my opinion, it's really, really cool for prototyping. So actually, it's been written by a community member who wanted to try out Flink uh, on Mesos. And so he basically was like, yeah, sure, I'll write an SDK for that. And actually, the Flink implementation is really, really short. As said, it's nothing. This is not the Flink I would run in production. But for them, just to test out that they can actually run it on Mesos, it's pretty cool. And by the way, we're just working on uh, the Flink integration and whoever is interested in Flink, Apache Flink, the next Flink version is gonna have explicit Mesos support and actually around the same time, we're also gonna have the DCS Universe package for that. And uh, the talk tomorrow is actually exactly about using an SDK. So we wrote uh, a DCS SDK, making it easier to write stateful applications. Uh, maybe just going a little bit back in the history of Mesos. So Mesos had already the intention when they, in the early design phase, to be an SDK to easily write distributed systems. And it's actually just using Mesos. It's really easy if you write stateless services, but as soon as you try to write stateful services, it becomes a little harder. And this is why we basically now have this new SDK, uh, which we'll present tomorrow. All right. So if you want to get started with your own framework, uh, there are like multiple points to get started. So if you're an existing framework and you're based on Java, there's actually something really cool and it's even in like the Apache Mesos uh, repository, it's a shim which allows you to write your software uh, against like a, this shim, against a common a uh, API and then you can switch in the background whether it still should use the old uh, lit Mesos version or it should use the new HTTP versions and for new features. And this is like something nice. It's most like for Java uh, based or Scala based services, but it really makes it easy to switch over from like the old world to the new world without really having to roll it out from scratch throughout your entire cluster uh, and then figuring out what's going wrong. Uh, second one is it's called like this uh, JavaScript framework. It's called Mesos framework. Uh, so that's nice if you just want to prototype a new framework. You just want to try out something new. So uh, that's something you could have a look at. And it's also like if you want to understand the basics of the HTTP API, I would also say this is like a nice piece to look at for understanding like the first bits. Not so much about like uh, failover and really like the production bits but just to understand the initial uh, ideas behind the HTTP API, this is a pretty good start to have a look at. And then also like, if you really want to write your own framework, I would urge you to look at the DCS SDK and probably visit this talk tomorrow. Uh, all of that is gonna enable you to really write really short definitions of frameworks. So for example, this is an example for scheduler with the Java-based API and with the DCS SDK, it's actually often sufficient that you just have like a JAML file from which code is generated for you. So you don't even have to code in the end. Best practices for uh, using uh, HTTP API. So first of all, as mentioned multiple times, really use libraries. Don't try to code it up from hand. At least look at what other people did before you. If you have a Java-based uh, framework, uh, or already written, have a look at the shim. It should be pretty straightforward to move over from your existing app implementation to the shim, and then step-by-step step switch over to the new HTTP world. As mentioned, like new features, they probably will only be supported for the HTTP API, so it's good to switch as early as possible. When 
running uh, HTTP-based frameworks in your cluster, uh, keep in mind that you should use persistent connections, so connection keep alive, and you'll see also the transfer encoding as a chunk. Uh, first you have the subscribe call, and you basically got to get events over time, so you have to keep your connection open. As you're keeping connections open, in order not to open too many connections, HTTP pipelining is a good thing to interleave uh, basically HTTP calls and not serialize them uh, and slow down your entire cluster. When writing your own scheduler or your own executor, make sure that you react to those heartbeats because otherwise you might be killed or you might not recognize when the other side isn't there anymore. And also, as with all things, it's really important to implement the authentication schemes uh, provided because otherwise you probably, uh, you could end up you having to configure your cluster in a really insecure way and actually allowing frameworks to hijack your cluster. And yeah, most of those are actually, if you're using one of those SDKs, they'll do like the best effort for you and you don't have to worry about it because it's just given by the SDK. All right, thank you very much. And uh, any questions? No questions? All right, then thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for writing uh, HTTP-based frameworks.